The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians in chapter 6 and reading verse 10 to verse 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. At the moment, we are considering in particular that phrase about the wiles of the devil. And having realized that the wiles of the devil, according to the teaching of the scripture and according to the history of the Christian church, are manifested in two main ways, we have been seeking to consider them along those two main ways. First of all, there are certain general activities of the devil, certain general manifestations of his wiles. We've already been doing that. And now we've come to the second main division, which is the more particular, the more personal, the more individual uh, attacks of the devil upon us as Christian people. That is why this subject, as you realize, is such a large one and such a complex one. The Christian life, in its essence, of course, at the beginning is essentially simple. But the moment you come into it, you begin to see that there are complexities not because of it, but because of this very thing that we are considering uh, together. Uh, There is an essential simplicity that is in Christ, as the Apostle Paul reminds the Corinthians in the second epistle in chapter 11. But the devil is always concerned to turn that essential simplicity which is in Christ into something involved and complex and difficult. And it is because of that that the Apostle warns us here in these solemn and moving words to be always on guard and above everything to realize something of the character and the quality of this most powerful adversary who is set against us. Now, I was indicating as we began to consider this last Sunday morning, that uh, these wiles are generally manifested uh, along certain lines. It'll be in connection with our watchfulness. It'll be in connection with our reading of this word. It'll be in connection with prayer. And it'll be in connection with self-examination. And uh, he comes to us with regard to those things along three main obvious channels. There is the mind, and there is the experience, and there is the practical daily life and living. Now, there are many other possible uh, classifications that one might adopt. It seems to me that uh, that is the most uh, practical uh, classification uh, that I, at any rate, am aware of. And uh, I'm simply going to try to group uh, some of these more obvious and uh, frequent manifestations of the wiles of the devil under these various headings. Now, some of them, of course, will have a more particular application to some people than others, but uh, we're all subject to them all, and uh, it is our business, therefore, to be aware of them all. To be forewarned is to be forearmed in this matter, and the whole teaching of the Bible, in a sense, is this, and especially of these epistles, that the first beginning of wisdom in these matters is to have this knowledge The devil trades on our ignorance. These epistles were all written to get rid of ignorance, to give people knowledge and truth and learning and enlightenment. And therefore, we must follow the instruction. Now, I was suggesting that uh, one of the commonest of things which the devil does is to try to make us lose our balance. In other words, he tries to upset the balance between the mind, the intellectual apprehension, and the experience, the sensibilities, the feeling, the experiential aspect, and the practice. And the moment he can produce a 
a lack of balance, an imbalance, as it were. In that respect, of course, he has achieved his end and object. So there is nothing more important for us than to be certain always that we are maintaining a true balance, that we don't become eccentric Christians. Now that's speaking very generally about uh, the three aspects, the three roots. Having done that, we can now come to a consideration of the particular attacks which come along the root of the mind. We must start with this because obviously this is the most important thing in men. This is uh, the greatest of all gifts, the gift of mind, the gift of apprehension, the gift of understanding. It is the one thing that above everything else marks out men uh, from the animals. This ability which man has in this amazing manner of contemplating himself and of thinking in an abstract manner. It's a very great gift and therefore it is man in his fallen condition. It is man's greatest danger. And of course the devil has always been particularly active in attacking mankind along this root of the mind and the intellect and the understanding. And the scriptures have a great deal of teaching with regard to this particular matter. We shall try to deal later with the more direct attack upon the experience and the feelings and so on. Now, obviously, this morning we are dealing in particular with the more intelligent people. The more intelligent you are, the more exposed you are to the attacks which we are going to consider. We are dealing with people who are anxious to learn and anxious to know. Of course, there are people who don't want to learn, as I was indicating last Sunday morning. They're not interested in knowledge. They're just practical people. They must be doing things. They're people who like to live on their feelings. And if they don't have a riot of the feelings, nothing's happened. Well, of course, all this doesn't apply to them. They're already uh, hopelessly enmeshed in the wiles of the devil. They are in an entirely hopeless state, of course. People who refuse to think and to use their minds in connection with their Christian faith are in the most dangerous condition that anybody can possibly be in. They're the obvious prey to the next cult that comes along or the latest excitement they'll be after it. But if we are aware of this and are concerned therefore about knowledge and understanding and apprehension of truth, well then there are certain special uh, temptations and dangers uh, to which we are exposed. And here are some of them. I've tried to pick them out of the scriptures themselves. My first heading, therefore, would be the wiles of the devil as uh, manifested through what the, the apostle calls philosophy and vain deceit. You noticed it in Colossians 2, 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, through the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Now, we generally agreed that this was the particular and peculiar Colossian heresy. Different churches were subject to different things. It's quite clear that the members of the Christian church at Colossae were highly intelligent and intellectual people. And therefore, they, of all others, were subject to this. They're not the only ones. You will find in the first epistle of Paul to Timothy that a great deal of this same subject is taken up. It's in the first chapter. It's in the last chapter where he talks about science, learning, falsely so-called. Indeed, you will find that this runs as a theme in many of the New Testament epistles. I've already quoted 2 Corinthians 11, where Paul says that he is very concerned, lest they, as the serpent beguiled Eve, uh, they also will be tempted away from the simplicity that is in Christ. Same thing there. It was characteristic, of course, of the Greek mentality. The Greeks were very able and intelligent people. The apostle doesn't have to write this sort of thing to the Galatians. They were a much more primitive people. They were a more elemental kind of people. They were the people who lived much more in their emotions and in their feelings. So he doesn't have to write about this particular intellectual danger to them, but he does with these various others. And it's interesting to trace this particular danger in these various epistles. Well, now then, here you see was a danger that had already arisen 
in the earliest days of the Christian church, and I would hazard the opinion that it is of all dangers, perhaps the greatest danger of all at this present moment in the life of the Christian church. What does it mean? Well, it means this. There is no doubt at all that in the last analysis, the greatest single enemy of the Christian faith and the Christian truth is philosophy. Now, why do I say that? Well, because for this reason, it seems to me to be the most basic of all the dangers. What does philosophy mean? Well, it means this. It means a final confidence in human reason. In the power of man's mind. In man's ability to arrive at truth, to comprehend it, and to encompass it. That is what philosophy really means. It means this trust in the ability of man to arrive himself at a knowledge of the truth. Or, if you like, we can look at it in a different way. The ultimate problem is always the problem of authority. What is the ultimate authority? And here I think we come to something which, as I'm saying, is quite basic and fundamental. According to the teaching of the Bible from beginning to end, our authority is to be revelation. Now, here is the sort of great watershed that uh, determines a man's whole position in these matters. We are either trusting entirely and only and exclusively to the revelation which God has been graciously pleased to give, or else, to some extent and to some measure, we are trusting to our own ability, our own knowledge, our own understanding. And it is just there that this whole danger of the wiles of the devil uh, comes in. It is this uh, whole danger of being governed by what is called modern knowledge, modern thought. And especially today, of course, in terms of science. But it isn't only scientific knowledge, it is any kind of knowledge. You see, the Greeks stood for this above everybody else. That was the country, the Greek, they were the people above all others who were famous for their philosophers. The great philosophers had been and had taught, as you know, before our Lord ever came into this world, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, and the rest, there they were. Now, there was the great flowering period in the human mind and intellect. And they were trying to understand life and the whole universe. They had a feeling that there was a power behind it all. They believed in the gods, and they were trying to find these gods. You remember the Apostle Paul found that in Athens there was a temple with this inscription over it, to the unknown God. And they were trying to find that God. They were trying by processes of reason and of thought and of meditation to arrive at that knowledge. Now that's essentially philosophy. Now the Bible starts on this whole supposition that man, because he is fallen and sinful, and because he is finite, can never arrive at that knowledge. That, I say, is the first postulate of the Christian message. The world, by wisdom, knew not God. Very well. At its best and at its highest in the flowering period of Greek philosophy, it failed to arrive at this knowledge of God. It made use of all its learning, all its information, its great brain power and ability and power to think logically. With it all, it completely failed. Then, we are told, it was when the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching, or the foolishness of the thing preached to save them that believe. So that you've got an absolute distinction. The gospel starts on this basis, that we are completely helpless in this matter of getting to know God, that we are incapable of arriving at truth, but that God in his infinite kindness has been pleased to reveal it, and that all we've got to do to use the words of our Lord is to become as little children. Except he be converted and become as little children, he says, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. 
We've got to use the language of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, 23, I think it is. I'll quote it later. If any man willeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be made wise. What's that mean? Well, it means this, that if a man wants to be wise in this ultimate sense, he's got to stop being a philosopher. The philosopher is the wise man. So if any man really wants to be wise, says Paul, let him become a fool in order that he may be made wise. And to become a fool means that you say, very well, I admit I can't do it. My mind is insufficient. Modern knowledge doesn't help me. I am absolutely shut into the revelation that God has given. That's Christianity. That's the beginning of Christianity. Ah, oh, but says somebody, that's obscurantism. That's a man committing intellectual suicide. It isn't. What it is is this. It is a man using his reason, if you like, in such a way as to come to the inevitable conclusion that his reason is not sufficient. That's my paraphrase of that immortal statement of Blaise Pascal, that brilliant mathematician and scientist. He said it is the supreme achievement of reason to show us that there is a limit to reason. What a wonderful test that. That's the whole trouble in the world today, that people don't realize the meaning of that great dictum of Pascal. It is the supreme achievement of reason to show that there is a limit to reason. And the whole trouble today is that men haven't seen the limit to reason. They're still trying to understand and to go on. And that is where they all go wrong. Here is the beginning of Christianity. I come to the end of my reason. And my reason, as it were, dictates to me that I must look to and believe and accept the revelation. I confess I don't know. I can't understand. I become as a little child and I look up into the face of him who is the way, the truth, and the life. That's the beginning of Christianity. And the moment you come into it in that way, then you begin to use your understanding and it grows and develops before you and there is literally no end to it. Well, now, then, there is the basic Christian position. And indeed, no man can become a Christian unless he passes that way. There is no other way but, and this is what the apostle is telling us, the moment we become Christians in that way, the devil will begin to attack us. And what he will say is this, well, of course, you are quite right. That's the right way to become a Christian. He'd been saying the exact opposite before, of course. But now, having seen that he's failed and that we've become Christians by the grace of God, he now takes a new line altogether and he says, yes, that's quite right. That's, of course, the way to begin. You must have that given something. But now, having come in, now, of course, you, you no longer believe the Bible as it is. See, the Bible was written, he tells us, nearly 2,000 years ago. The last book was written nearly 2,000 years ago. Some of it, of course, is much older. goes back through the centuries. It's all right. It was very contemporary when it was written. And, of course, the New Testament and so on, it's, uh, it's all right, but it's in an ancient idiom. Nobody understands these terms any longer and so on. And not only that, there's a great deal of knowledge available which they hadn't got at that time. So the devil says, now, it's all right, you're all right there in your coming into the Christian life, but if you really want to be a modern, up-to-date, 20th century Christian, you've got, of course, to pay attention to modern knowledge, to discoveries of science and so on. And by now we've discovered certain things. The science of anthropology, for instance, has taught us, together with evolution, that um, man wasn't created, as the Bible tells us, but... Men's gradually evolved and so on. And there are various other aspects, these discoveries that are being made. You read in your newspaper about paintings painted 60,000 years ago or even more or less. But there it is. Anthropology and all that has taught us all this. We now are in an entirely different position. Of course, you still believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but... And the moment you add that but, you've already succumbed to the wiles of the devil. And that is, I believe, one of the greatest dangers confronting the Christian church still. I would say that it is the greatest danger confronting evangelical people at this present moment. They have got in the United States what they call a new evangelicalism, which as far as I can understand it is nothing but this very thing. They say evangelicalism has got to be brought up to date. It's been too negative and obscurantist. It hasn't been paying sufficient attention to science and to learning. It's lost intellectual respectability. And of course that kind of thing will come over into this country. 
And indeed, it's already come into this country. One is finding that uh, people now are not hesitating to accept as basic authority uh, certain extra scriptural statements and authorities. Now, let's be clear about this. This question of the relationship of uh, the Bible uh, to scientific knowledge or uh, science and religion is a very difficult and a very complex one. But it needn't be as complex as the devil is making it at the present time. This is the position as I understand it. As long as science uh, deals with facts, accept it. But the moment it begins to deal with theories, put up all the queries that you've got anywhere in your possession. And the whole trouble today is that the devil is confusing the issue by confusing theories and facts. Now, let me say it once more. The theory of evolution is nothing but a theory. It is not a proved fact. So when they talk about evolution, they're not being scientists, they're being philosophers. That's pure speculation. Now then, all I'm saying is this, that I must never accept speculation as one of, one of my basic authorities. Or let me put it in a different way to you. The great basic truths I must take and accept only from the Bible. In other words, when I'm considering the whole nature of man, I must take it from the Bible. When I'm considering the doctrine of sin, I must take it from the Bible. I mustn't take it from the theory of evolution. The Bible tells me that man was made perfect and fell. Now, I don't care what is put before me. I say I will not believe any other view of man's present condition. And why not? Because I know that it's wrong. This is God's revelation. The whole of the Christian salvation depends upon this. So I cannot go on saying that I believe the Christian doctrine of salvation if I cease to believe in the fall of men because I believe in evolution. You see, that's how the devil comes in, in his subtlety. Changes my authority. Why should I no longer believe in the fall and in the biblical doctrine of sin? Ah, oh, well, but science is... You see, there, the moment I've gone outside the realm of revelation, I am saying now that men, with his reason and ability and his power to investigate and to collate facts is able to lay down postulates with regard to fundamental truth. But the Bible starts by telling me that he can't do that. That that's the very thing that man has failed to do. That man is blinded by the God of this world, he is blinded by sin, he doesn't know himself because he doesn't know God. So I must never do that. And of course it's the same with all the other doctrines. And the fact of the matter is that there is no new knowledge which in any way makes the slightest difference to the basic postulates of the Christian faith and of the Christian message. That is why I say we must beware of philosophy and vain deceit. The Apostle Paul Writing, you remember, in that first epistle to the Corinthians, in the first chapter, says that he preaches Christ, preaches the cross of Christ, he says, not with wisdom. Why? Lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. You see, a man can stop by believing in the cross of Christ, but if he brings in philosophy, he'll end by saying something else. And so he makes the cross of Christ of none effect. He ends with something which is entirely and radically different from his original belief and position. And the, these New Testament epistles had to be written because of that. Some of these clever philosophers had written up, they said, it's all right, you're quite right in being a Christian, but you know, if you really want to understand it, don't take it as that man Paul put it in its bluntness, in its stark openness, talking about the blood and about the justice and the righteousness of God. They said, that's all wrong. The cross is a very beautiful thing if you only saw it truly, and so on. And so, you see, they evaporated the glory of the cross into some beautiful philosophical thought. Now then, that is why the Apostle calls it philosophy and vain deceit. So I would sum it up by putting it like this. I must not base the view I have or the position in which I stand with regard to any one of these matters that involves my relationship to God. I must not stand upon anything except upon the revelation that I am given 
in this book. The moment I accept any extra-biblical authority, I have already succumbed to the wiles of the devil. Let us be wary, my friends. Let us be careful. You see, the devil comes in in this way. He says, now look here. Do you really want people to listen to your message? Well, if you do, you'd better start by realizing this, that you're preaching in the mid-20th century and not in the first century. If you think that modern, educated, enlightened people are going to believe that old, simple gospel as it was preached by the Lord Jesus Christ himself and by Paul, you're making a terrible mistake. They won't listen to you. They'll ridicule it. So it says the devil, now then, you put it in this way that they can accept it. You mustn't offend their susceptibilities. You mustn't be an offense to their knowledge and to their intellectual understanding. Now that, I say, is of the very devil. If we really believe the message of the Bible, we've got to say this. This is the truth of God. It is always offensive to the natural men. It has always been. It was offensive to the people in Paul's time. You see, that's what the moderns don't know because they don't know their scriptures. The Greek philosophers said when they listened to Paul that he was a fool. They said all this is nonsense. It is folly to them. The natural men receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he, because they are spiritually discerned. They were already saying it was folly. They will always go on saying it is folly. And you see, you and I are to say this. Let them say what they like. My business is to preach the truth of God. And the Holy Spirit will honor this. And it will even convince the intellectuals. It has done so. It is still doing so. But the moment I try in order to get at men begin to use these enticing words of men's wisdom and to bring in my modern knowledge and base part of my position upon modern discovery, I've already abandoned the one thing that I'm told to do. I am to be a fool for Christ's sake. And there's no difficulty about this. The moment you know anything about science and its speculations and see the way that it's always changing, thank God. God, at the moment I say that we've got these two scientists in Cambridge fighting one another. Uh, it's a wonderful thing, this, you see. It just shows the hollowness of it all. How can you base your ultimate position upon what any man may say? He's blind, he's sinful, of course not. Here and here alone is the truth. And as scientific theories come and go, this goes on. It is the truth once and forever delivered to the saints. And there is no other truth. Beware of philosophy and vain deceit. Here it is then at the very beginning. But let me go on to another aspect. This uh, desire to be philosophical and to have understanding comes in in this way. Not always in that open way which I've been indicating already as a sort of fundamental controlling influence upon my basic thought, but sometimes like this. And this is a much more common one, I think. The desire to understand and the desire to explain. We've all fallen to this, haven't we? We say, no, but I, I, I can't understand how this or that. Uh, how can, I can't understand how one death can cover mine. I, I don't see that. I, I don't see how the righteousness... I, I can't follow it. I, now, this desire for understanding... This is another aspect of this philosophy and vain deceit. You see, the natural mind always wants to understand everything. That is the whole basis of philosophy. The philosopher is a man who claims that he's got it in him, as I say, to comprehend, to encompass all truth. And he always wants to have a system which will cover everything. It must always be complete. There must be nothing left which he cannot explain. Now, that's in us, every one of us. We are all natural philosophers. And there are many who are kept out of the Christian life simply because I don't understand this. I don't understand that. All right, but even after you've come into the Christian life, the devil will come and will worry you with this, and you'll say, no, but I can't follow this. I can't see how. Now, there again, you see, is the wiles of the devil in philosophy and vain deceit. We've got to be content with what has been laid down once and forever in Deuteronomy 29, 29. 
Listen to it. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of the law. There's no advance on that. There are secret things, there are things which God has been prepared to reveal. And what you and I have got to do is this, we've got to be content with the things that have been revealed and not even attempt to try to get into an understanding of the things that are secret. I regard this as one of the most important rules in the Christian life. Let me put it again in terms of that 1 Corinthians 3, it's 18, I see, not 23. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Now, that's the basic rule. In other words, you and I have got to come to this position. Because this is the truth of God, by definition, there will be things about it that I can't understand. Look at the great, this great man, this Apostle Paul. He stands back and he says, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. But you notice what he says, Great is the mystery of godliness. Who can understand that? Oh, but people say, I don't understand how there can be two natures in one person. Of course you can't. What a fool you are ever to have thought that you could. That's the answer. Fancy pitting you a little mind and brain and you are ignorance against the mystery of godliness. I can't understand. Of course you can't understand. What you've got to do is to understand yourself first. And the moment you understand yourself, you won't try to understand that. You'll realize that by definition it's impossible. It eludes understanding. You see, is it possible for a finite mind to encompass the infinite? Philosophy should never be allowed to put its nose into this matter. It should be entirely excluded. Dare I say it, I have no doubt in my own mind that the Christian church very largely is as she is today because in the theological colleges and seminaries for the last hundred years so much time has been given to the teaching of philosophy. It is the greatest enemy of the Christian truth. Thank God that this is so, because, you see, if this were not so, and if a man by means of philosophy becomes a Christian, how unfair it would be, how unequal it would be. You'd have no point in sending your foreign missionaries to the heart of, of Central Africa. How could they possibly preach this gospel to people who know nothing and who can't read and who can't think? You see, the whole thing is idiotic. No, no, when you come to the gospel, we're all one. The greatest philosopher of this morning is as much of a fool as is the most ignorant person. And, of course, the greatest philosopher in this country is showing that at the present time, isn't he? Very well. But, you see, this is basic Christianity. And thank God I say for this, otherwise it wouldn't be God's way of salvation. It would be unequal, it would be unfair. No, no. When you come in here, you've got to start by saying this. Now then, God, in his amazing love and grace, has been graciously pleased to reveal these things. I'm going to rejoice in them. I can't understand them. They're so glorious because I can't, and I'm not even going to try to. So that when you are worried in the future, when somebody comes to you and says, now look here, what I can't understand is this. Can you explain this to me? You mustn't be afraid to say, of course I can't. I don't know. There are many things we don't know. Take the early chapters of Genesis. There are many things I still am not clear about. I don't understand them. It doesn't worry me at all. I'm not meant to know them. All I know is this, as the author of the epistle to the Hebrews puts it, there in that uh, great 11th chapter of his right at the beginning, in verse 3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. That is the truth about it all, and I don't know much more than that. There are many gaps in my knowledge that doesn't worry me at all. I'm content with the knowledge that God is and that God is the creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and all that in them is. God made man in his own image. That I am certain of. 
There is no question that man is a unique creation in the image of God. Why is he as he is? Man rebelled and fell. That I am certain of. Now, there are many things that I'm not certain of when you come to details. Don't be worried. Just say, I don't know. I think one day I shall. I'll be given the full and the final revelation in the glory. But while I'm in this world, I say the secret things belong unto God, the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us. Very well then, never go beyond that knowledge of what has been revealed. And don't even encourage for a second the desire to understand what you were never meant to understand. Go back to that question again. How can there be two natures in one person? You answer me this. Where is the soul in men? What's the relationship between the soul and the body? Do you know? And of course you don't know. And yet you know you've got a soul. You can't understand these things. They're mysteries. And what is truly astonishing to me is this, that men and women don't draw the obvious conclusion the greater modern knowledge grows. The more the knowledge grows, the greater I see the mystery of it all. Look at the atom. Oh, men say, we've now split it, we now understand. You understand? Do you understand how this terrific, almost impossible to conceive power is in that minute thing with that tremendous tension? Can you understand that? Of course you can't understand it. It's a great and a wonderful mystery. The more knowledge advances, the greater it reveals the mystery. Very well then, let's be content with it. There is a second way. Let's go on to a third. There is always the danger that the devil will come to us and try to persuade us that our knowledge which we have from the scripture needs to be supplemented a little. Here again I quote that statement in 1 Timothy 6, 20 and 21 where the apostle is warning Timothy to be very careful about this very kind of thing that we are looking at. Listen to him. O Timothy, he says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings. What a wonderful description of the writings and the speeches of the philosophers. Profane and vain babblings. Perfect. And oppositions of science falsely so called. Now, that doesn't mean science in our sense. Science there means the knowledge. And science, knowledge falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. You see, it had already happened then. Profane and vain babblings and oppositions of knowledge falsely so called. Timothy says, Paul, there's only one way to keep yourself from that. Hold on to that which has been committed to thy trust. Keep it. Guard it. Never look outside it. Keep yourself rigidly there. These other people have gone after that. They have heard concerning the faith. He says indeed earlier of some of them that they've already made shipwreck of their faith. What does this mean? Well, that was that peculiar heresy against which the apostle was warning Timothy himself and warning him to teach others also. It was this. It was a kind of admixture of uh, philosophy and mysticism. And I think that next to philosophy I would put as the greatest danger, mysticism. What's it mean? It means this. Mysticism is a manifestation of the desire for immediacy. An immediate knowledge. Now there is something very right about that because we are meant to know God. It's because we are meant to know God that the devil comes in and brings in mysticism. What he says is this, you see, that it is possible to have this immediate and direct knowledge of God in a much easier way than that which is taught in the scriptures. I needn't go over this. I really did touch upon it as I was dealing with the cults a few weeks ago. The cults are all based on that. But apart from the cults, you get it in the whole movement of what is called mysticism. You see, it puts it like this. It says, look here, God is in you. God is in everybody. And if you want to know God, all you've got to do is to sink into yourself. All you've got to do is just to concentrate on this one thing. And you shut out everything else and you sink into yourself. You go through a kind of negative phase and you die completely and then you'll come to the point of illumination. And so you've got the mystical way, so-called. The various steps on the mystical way. Now, that has been threatening Christianity from the very beginning. 
It was threatening those people who were under the charge of Timothy. It was threatening them at Colossae. This curious admixture of mysticism and speculation, the two things always go together. It's very difficult not to digress about these things, but the most perfect example perhaps that we've had of this very thing in this country during the present century was that very able man known as Dean Ng, once Dean of St. Paul's. He was a typical philosopher and a great philosopher, but he was also very interested in mysticism. The two things very often go together. You see, because when you get into trouble with your thinking, you leap to mysticism, and then you get something direct. Now, both of them are wrong because they both bypass the scriptures. You'll never arrive at a knowledge of God by sinking into yourself. There is no knowledge of God apart from the Lord Jesus Christ and the full and the perfect revelation that is in him. Hold fast the head, says the New Testament. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. There is no direct way to God apart from him. You can't bypass this great doctrine. Beware then of philosophy and vain deceit. This attempt, I say, to shortcut the New Testament and arrive by some mystical procedure at this wonderful, immediate, direct knowledge and experience of God. It is a part of philosophy and of vain deceit. Very well, perhaps we can leave it at that for this morning. I have given time to this general consideration of this matter because, as I am saying, there is nothing that is more subtle at the present time. You get it in almost all modern books on this question of religion, insinuating itself in a most subtle manner. You see, this is, I think, where things went wrong in the last century. Whenever the Christian church is afraid of being a fool for Christ's sake, she's already gone wrong. And I suppose this change happened somewhere around about 1850 to 1870. There had been that great evangelical awakening of the 18th century. It was mainly amongst the common people, the masses, the working people who were in their ignorance. It was mainly amongst them. It wasn't only, but it was mainly amongst them. And all the churches that came out of that were consisted of such people. They were dismissed, of course, and laughed at by people like Lord Chesterfield and various other great men, these great thinkers and philosophers and cultured people of the 18th century. They called this enthusiasm. They despised it. But that's how it started, and while it kept like that, it was very powerful. But as you came into the last century, things began to change. Why? Well, these very people became more respectable themselves, and their children had more education. And they began to say, now we must have a cultured ministry. You, can't, you can no longer just proclaim that simple unvarnished gospel. You must have it illustrated by quotations from Greek philosophy. And you must have a, a certain knowledge of the, the Latin classics. The people are now expanding in their knowledge. And so the church began to do this very thing. Mid-Victorianism is mainly responsible for the present state of the Christian church. It sold the past. The church wanted to be intellectually respectable. She wanted to be able to show the world how she really understands. And the moment she does that, she sold everything. We are fools for Christ's sake. You believe this gospel and people say to you, what, do you still believe that? Do you still believe in sin? Well, psychology has explained that long. They'll laugh at you. Do you still believe the Bible? Do you still take that as your ultimate authority? Do you really say that you put that before all this that has been discovered in the last 2,000 years about these very things? And if you don't say unashamedly, yes, because it is still the truth and the only truth, if you don't do that, you've already succumbed to philosophy and vain deceit. We are meant to be fools for Christ's sake. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ 
This is the thing by which the world has been crucified unto me and I unto the world. God forbid that I should glory in anything else. Ah, people say, but we want interesting sermons. We'd rather like, you know, a little bit about what science has now brought in and how it's explaining things and making it more easy to understand the Bible. God forbid that I should ever do such a thing. If you think it's more easy to believe in miracles now than it was 2,000 years ago, you still don't believe in miracles. You'll never understand miracles. By definition, they're beyond understanding. No, no. There is nothing needed in addition to this. We must never put any plus behind it. This is everything. This is all. This is complete. This is God's revelation. And I must reject anything that offers itself to me as a, a help to this, an addition to this, a kind of supplement to this, a kind of bringing this up to date. No, no. It's as up to date now as it was at the beginning. It'll always be up to date. I don't want anything different. I don't know as much as the Apostle Paul knew about God and about Christ. Neither do your modern philosophers. Therefore, I'm going on listening to him and not to them. Reject everything else. All that Paul taught was what had been given to him. It was the revelation that he had received. And we are absolutely shut into this. And we must shut our eyes to every form of philosophy and of vain deceit. That's one of the ways, in other words, of taking unto you the whole armor of God. It's just one of the ways of having your loins girt about with the truth, the foundation of everything. May God give us wisdom to gird ourselves with the truth that we may be able to withstand all the wiles of the devil. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.